things tonight about what camp meant to them and how they were spoken to there by the preaching. So we'll look forward to that this evening. Did you learn your verse of the week? We started a new passage found in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 4. 2 Peter 1 and verse number 4. A little longer verse, but let's see how we do on that one here today. Are you ready? Whereby are given and precious promises. These be partakers having escaped the corruption. All right, a little weak out there this morning. A little bit longer verse to learn, but work on it some more and move on to verse number five for next week. What's going to be in the list that we're looking at are what's called the Christian virtues. Virtues that the Lord wants to see in our life as Christians. We ought to know these. We ought to practice these. And so we'll be learning down through verse number eight if you want to keep working ahead. Next week, verse number five. Take your Bibles this morning and turn to the book of Revelation, chapter number 11 and verse number 17. Revelation 11, verse number 17 for our text today. Here we have the word of God saying to us, saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and wast and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned. I want to speak to you today on the need of exalting and praising our Lord. The book of Revelation is filled with that. The main topic that we hear about concerning the book of Revelation is that of future things. And it is a book filled with much about the future. But scattered throughout this book are tremendous bursts of praise to the Lord. Some of the passages are in Revelation 1, 6, Revelation 4, 8 through 11, Revelation 5, 8 through 14, a scene in heaven with everybody praising the Lord there. Here in chapter number 11 that I just read, chapter 14, 2 and 3, chapter 15, 3 and 4, chapter 19, 1 through 6, which caps it all off with four great Hallelujahs given to us in that first chapter. So there's great praise found in the book of Revelation. And of course, it's important that we give God praise and adoration and exaltation all the time in our lives. Let's ask the Lord to help us and bless us as we study together on this topic. Heavenly Father, we come before you today and we thank you that we've been able to sing and praise your holy name and all that you've done in the songs that we have sang this morning. We pray that you've received praise, that you've been pleased. And Lord, now as we come to the proclaiming of your word, we ask you, Lord, to certainly speak to our hearts about this subject of adoration and exaltation and praise of you. Certainly, we need to do it more than we ever do. It's something that will be going on in heaven for eternity. It's certainly good for us to get in the habit of praising you and thanking you and exalting you here below. So use me today. Speak to our hearts from this passage of Scripture. For we ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Now, praise and adoration are important. I read a story about a man trying to teach his horse to obey, to stop, and to start on his command. The man was very religious, so he came up with a couple of religious statements that he used all the time in his own life to train his horse with. When he gave the command, praise the Lord, the horse was to go forward. When he gave the command, hallelujah, the horse was supposed to stop. Well, one day he was riding the horse, and sadly he lost control of it. He forgot his words. 
The horse was running and running and galloping and galloping, and they were heading towards a cliff. So he started to think of all the words he knew. Amen. Jesus saves. Worthy. Holy. He was saying all these biblical words, and nothing was working. Finally, out of desperation, as the horse came right to the edge of the cliff, he burst out, Hallelujah! And the horse stopped one foot from plunging over the edge. The man wiped his head and said, Praise the Lord! <laughs> uh, that's funny, isn't it? But the point is, Praise and adoration is certainly something we ought to be giving to the Lord every single day of our lives. In the context of Revelation 11, we have the conclusion of some terrible judgments God is bringing on this earth in the future. It's during a period of time that we started studying on Wednesday nights, and that's a study on end times. On Wednesday nights, we're looking at the tribulation time right now. And during this tribulation time, we find that God brings seven trumpet judgments on this earth. The last one's recorded here in verse number 15 through 17. And as it uh, comes upon mankind, we see in verse 17, that's where our text is. Whereas God concludes these terrible judgments, we find that people are saying in heaven... Verse 10 or 16 talks about the four and 20 elders, which represent the church in heaven, and I'm not going to go into that today. But anyway, in heaven, we give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and wast and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned. I think we see in this today three great things to praise God for. Number one, his person. Lord God Almighty. Number two, his permanence. He, he, he is which art and wast and art to come. He's eternal. And finally, for his plan of the ages, found in the last part of this verse, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned. Just in this verse are three great things we ought to praise and exalt the Lord for. You know, the world's not going to do it. It's up to us as Christians to praise our God and lift his name up and exalt him for who he is and what he is doing. It's up to us. The psalmist did it a lot. Look at Psalm, hold your place here, look back at Psalm 145 just a moment and notice what the psalmist had to say here at the beginning of this great chapter. Psalm 145, verses 1 and 2. We read, I will extol thee, my God, O King. I will bless thy name forever and ever. I like this, verse 2. Every day will I bless thee, and I will praise thy name forever and ever. There it is. Something we ought to do. Praise the Lord every day of our lives. Number one, for his person who he is. Notice again in Revelation eleven seventeen, we give thanks, O Lord God Almighty. The first term applied to God there of his person is that he is Lord. What does that mean, that he's Lord? That means that he is the master. Lords back in this day and time were people that ruled over estates, ruled over other people. People were to bow down to their very command and obey them completely. That was a Lord. And of course, that definitely applies to us. Jesus Christ is our Lord. And you know, we need to understand the importance of that. I don't know if you realize it or not, but... God is in control of your life. He is the Lord whether you like it or not. Some people want to run their own lives and live the way they want, but since God is Lord, out of his mercy and grace, he allows them to go on for a while, but someday there will be an accounting. 
it could happen in this life with things that happen to them. If not now, it certainly will the day of their death, which nobody can avoid. That day is coming sooner or later for everyone. And then it's appointed unto men once to die, and after this, the judgment. Hebrews 9, 27, they will face God. So they need to realize the fact that he is Lord now. And as Christians, we should understand that. Whenever we trust Jesus Christ as Savior, it's not just to put a free ticket in our back pocket to get us into heaven. Jesus is the only way to get to heaven. I am the way, the truth, and the life, he said. We can't get there without him. But when you trust Jesus Christ as Savior, it's to accept him as a person into your life to have a relationship with, and that relationship should be that of Lord to serve it. That's the way it ought to be. You know, the Apostle Paul, great man in the Bible, of course, went so far as to call himself a doulos in the Greek when he uses the word servant of Jesus Christ. Do you know what doulos is? Slave. He called himself a slave of Jesus Christ. It wasn't a slave where he had to absolutely do everything the Lord said or God was going to hit him over the head and that's it. No, it's a love slave. He wanted to be a slave of Jesus Christ. He knew that Jesus as Lord knew every single step of this life that was best for him. And he wanted his life to totally conform to what the Lord wanted him to do. And you know, folk, that's the way we ought to be. God knows best your plight in life. He's put in his word the way Christians ought to live. A lot of men don't like that today. A lot of men trying to change the word of God and make it mean other things. I've read them. I know what they try to do. They have no basis for doing what they do, but they do it anyway. It's men and humanism and where we're at in our world of today. But God says, this is the way to live. Walk in it. That's what he expects of us. And since he saved us, he's given us heaven. We're going to live there forever. We've got uh, wonderful things ahead for us. It ought to be our reasonable service to say, your Lord, I'm following you. And we ought to praise him for that. You know, as Lord, he has said in Romans 8, 28, that he's working everything together for our good. Do you believe that? Then if you know God's working everything together for your good, you ought to absolutely make him Lord of your life. He knows what's best. You ought to follow him completely. And we ought to praise him for being our Lord. Notice secondly... He's called God, Lord God. Now, throughout the history of mankind, man has worshipped thousands of gods. They have come and gone through the history of time. And man has worshipped the sun, moon, and stars. Man has worshipped all kinds of gods in Greek culture, in Roman culture. They've worshipped gods that have come and gone. But there's only one God that keeps on going. That's our God. Because he's the only God. The gods of idols and stone were not gods, could do nothing for anybody whatsoever. Only our God is the true God. And he needs to be exalted and praised for who he is. He's a God that created all things. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. He's a God that's keeping everything going. When you read in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 17, it says, by him all things consist. God's still on the throne. I know sometimes people say, well, it doesn't seem like he is. So many wrong things going on in the world, but he is. In a few minutes we'll talk about his plan. and We'll see how that fits in. But nonetheless, he absolutely is in control of this universe and what's happening and what's taking place there. 
He's a God doing that. He's a God who has done many miraculous things through history. He's a God who parted the Red Sea for his people to walk across on dry land. He's a God that absolutely parted a rock and opened up a rock out there in the desert so 1.2 million Israelites could have water to drink as they crossed through the wilderness there. One rock supplying water for that many people. It's because God kept it coming out. He can work miracles, amen? He had manna fall from heaven to feed them all every single day. They could go out and collect it and have it there to eat. Miraculous God that we have. When they entered the promised land, he's the God that caused the walls of Jericho to come tumbling down so that that fortress that no human being could get in naturally could be conquered by the Israelites and help them conquer the Holy Land completely. I know people say, well, those are just fables. They aren't really true things. But you want to know something, folk? Archaeologists and all have done a lot of excavations over there. They have actually dug down, my understanding, and have found the original walls of Jericho. And a lot of those walls are all crumbled down, all messed up. They said they must have fallen because of an earthquake. Well, I don't know what God used, but he certainly caused the walls to fall down. The more that they dig and look over there in the Holy Land, the more they find things that absolutely follow God's word. By the way, uh, we saw a film here a couple years ago on what they found at the bottom of the Dead Sea, Red Sea. The bottom of the Red Sea are a bunch of wheels and different parts of things that look like they come from chariots and all that have been down there for ages and ages and ages right in the middle of the Red Sea. Just an evidence that could be where the Egyptians perished, as God said, in the Red Sea when they followed the children of Israel in there. They found all this. It's interesting. As time goes on, more and more things are constantly being discovered that back up what the Bible has to say. Last night, those who are at the potluck, Jim Taylor and uh, brought a film in here. It's not a Christian film. It's produced by a news agency. They were showing the evidence that Noah's Ark exists. A lot of people have seen it, and they had them on there showing their testimonies. Some of them have taken pictures. Of course, it's at the top of Mount Ararat, which is frozen over most of the year, so there's a very small window to ever have a hope of going up there and finding it. They say many people may have walked right across it, but it's under snow, so they wouldn't know. And uh, they keep trying to make more and more expeditions up there, see what they can find about Noah's Ark. Some people brought big pieces of wood back. They've tested it and found the wood to be nearly 5,000 years old. How'd that get up there, a Mount Ararat under ice? Well, they say very well could be pieces of the oh, Noah's Ark that they have found up there. So anyway, my point is this. God says he did all these miracles in his word. I trust the word of God, amen? amen. He's a miracle working God, so he needs to be praised for that. Needs to be praised for being our God. Then notice the third thing, he's almighty. God can do anything. And we've talked about his miracles just now. But you know one of the greatest miracles? One well, of the greatest miracles is changing men's hearts. We just were studying in my class last week, Sunday school class, the testimony of Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 1. He says he was the chief of sinners and God saved him. If God could take a man who was out to do Christianity in and see it ended and destroyed, persecute people who were preaching for Christianity, which he did, consented to a man like Stephen's death in Acts chapter 7 and had him stoned to death for his testimony for Christ. If a man could take somebody, if God could take somebody like that and change them to become the great apostle Paul, he can change anybody. That's the power of almighty God. He can get a hold of hearts and lives. In fact, 
Last Sunday morning, we mentioned another man who was very sinful and wicked, a slave driver by the name of John Newton. And of course, John Newton is the author of Amazing Grace. God changed him around and made him a preacher after being a horrible slave driver for many years. And of course, his song is Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. One well, of the greatest things about Almighty God is that He can change the hearts and lives of people. Praise Him for that. But we come to number two this morning. We see we ought to praise God for His person, who He is. But in our verse here it says, which art and wast and art to come, we ought to praise God for His permanence. Or we ought to praise God that He's eternal. God has no beginning. Now that is a tough thing to comprehend. Everything we know has a beginning. So it's hard for us to imagine something that has no beginning. Some people say the best way to look at God is a circle. There's no beginning or an ending in a circle. It just goes on and on and on. Maybe uh, when we get to heaven, God will explain it, for it to us a little bit more to try to understand his eternality. But there's never been a time when God hasn't existed. There will never be a time when God does not exist. He is totally eternal. Because he's eternal, he deserves to be worshipped above everything else. Now, you know, in our day and time, we don't have so many people bowing down to gods made of wood and stone. But there are gods that take people's lives. And they absolutely don't have time to praise or worship God Almighty. What are those gods in our day and time? Money. Some people are so busy making money and making material things, they don't have time to darken the door of the church and praise the Lord. They're too busy working. Well, I've got to work. I've got to listen. If you can never come to church and never worship God because you're too busy working, you better change jobs. You're missing one of the most important things God wants you to do with your life. How can a Christian claim to be a Christian and never worship the Lord in his house? Jesus said, I'll build my church. I gave myself for the church. I love the church, Ephesians 5.25. And when people forsake it and say they're still good Christians, they're liars. You cannot be a good Christian according to the Bible and not be a part of God's church. I challenge you to show me how. Well, I know a lot of people go to church that are hypocrites. That's true. But that doesn't mean the church should not be a part of a person's life. A person is not going to be very close to the Lord. I'll tell you that if they don't come faithfully to church. That's it. Because God says, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together as the man or some is. Now, how can a person look at that and then absolutely say, I'm right with God and I don't go to church? Tell me how. When they disobey God's command. A heart is not right with God when they disobey God's command. It's not. It's sad to see where Christians are today. And I read some statistics Wednesday night. They're so sad. Only 25% now, millennials, people that are between 18 and 30, consider church and religion to be important in their lives. Three-fourths of them do not. In our country, 2018, the latest statistics. That is so sad to see. Do you know the, the crowd that is 65% saying that church and religion is important in their lives? Old people. 65 and older. So what's that showing us, folk? Jesus' statement. When I come back to earth, will I find faith on the earth? Is there anybody going to be living by God's word, the Bible, when Jesus comes back? We know there will be some because he's going to catch him up to meet him in the air at the rapture. But as time goes on, less and less people are interested in spiritual things because one of the things is they got the God of money. Another God that people have is making a name for themselves, being famous. 
I want people to know who I am and see my name in the papers and see me. I mean, they work out. They just put so much time and effort into becoming famous. Whether it's in sports, whether it's in politics, or wherever it is, they give all their time to that. That's their God. The God for many people is pleasure. I was amazed this week in our newspaper. Do you know, cropping up all across our country are recovery centers like AA for alcoholics, recovery centers for people playing video games. People are totally getting addicted to it. So if they got to have centers to go to, to try and get them over being addicted to video games. That's their God. I hear of sometimes the young people in our, in our school they can't always have their work done on time, but they talk about how they step to one or two playing video game. What's their God? See, we don't have gods maybe made of idols, but we sure have some gods that take all the time of our life. and We don't have time for the Lord. Oh, how we need to wake up. God is eternal. We need to focus on eternal things and praise Him and adore Him and exalt those eternal things. When we get to heaven someday, that's one thing we'll be doing. You know, I, when people can't praise the Lord today, how are they going to make it in heaven? How are they going to make it in heaven? I hear people talk about going to heaven and playing golf. Going to heaven and fishing in the big lake river that God's got up there. He's got a river of life running through the heaven. I'm going to be up there fishing away. <laughs> I read nothing about that in scripture. But I read something you will be doing. Praising before the throne of God day and night. Ugh. They can't praise him now. They can't stand an hour in church. How in the world are they going to make it in heaven? For God Almighty. Maybe the problem is they aren't going to be there. Some of the most shocking verses in Scripture that I think about all the time are found in Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 to 23. Jesus himself given them. Says many, not a few people now, but many are going to call him Lord, Lord. And they're not entering heaven. They've prophesied in his name. So there's preachers. They've cast out demons, verse 22 says. They've done, I like this one, they've done many, it says this, many wonderful works. Boy, you listen to most people out there, they know they're going to heaven because they're a good person. They've done many wonderful works. But Jesus says to that crowd, Matthew 7, 23, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Pretty shocking words. An awful lot of people need to wake up. I can't understand how people can be a Christian. <laughs> Pastor Tyson and me knocked on the door this week. Lady came around the edge of the house. She had apparently seen us come up to the house, and she says, yes. We said, we're from Calvary Baptist Church. We're looking for so-and-so. They died. Oh, well, we're sorry to hear that they passed away. Uh, what about you? Do you go to church? I'm a Christian. Bye. That was it. I mean, I'm a Christian. Bye. She did not want to talk to us. want to say anything. Isn't that a strange Christian to act like that? It's unbelievable how people act that claim that they're Christians. But anyway, folks. I trust today we see how God's eternal and the most important thing to, in us in our lives is the Lord God Almighty. And like the psalmist, every day we want to praise Him and thank Him for all that He means to us. I'm trying to encourage you to do that. Final thing today mentioned in this verse that we ought to praise and thank God and exalt Him for is for His plan. Notice the end of verse 17. Because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned. Now this is, of course, at the end of the trumpet judgments I mentioned earlier. When God finishes this trumpet judgment, a lot of terrible things have happened on earth and people are seeing how he's in control. And it mentions here he's taken his power and he's reigned. 
He is the King of kings, people will realize. Now, in the day and time which we live, a lot of people say, well, God must be in a rocking chair up there. He's not doing much for the world today. It's a mess. The violence, the wars, the killings. You look at the way people live and act. It just doesn't seem like God cares anymore or God's involved in this world. He is. The things that are going on today, we've studied on Wednesday nights. They're according to God's plan. Man for centuries has wanted to live his life apart from God. God is giving men more and more what they want. So that ultimately, when that tribulation time hits here, they have the person on the throne of this world called the Antichrist who's also called, and I never get over this in Scripture, the man of sin. People want their sin. They don't want to live the way God wants them to live. So God's allowing things to wind down to that very point where the person ruling this world is a man of sin. And people get so involved in sin, when you read this in, in uh, Revelation 16, when God judges them and pours out horrible things on this earth, instead of repenting and saying, God, oh, I realize you're on the throne. You're persecuting us and we got to get right with you. No, they will not repent. They get more and more into their sins. Isn't that shocking? Jeremiah 17, 9 tells us why. The heart of man is desperately wicked. Who can know it? Well, it's going to come out in future days. All that's according to God's plan, basically letting man have his humanism and atheism and forgetting about God and he's taking his hand off and terrible times are ahead, but men think it's going to be great when they can live totally the way they want and throw off all of God, the Bible, Christianity, throw it all off. It's what they want. But then they'll find out God's plan is it's going to end. His judgments occur, and then Jesus Christ comes back at the end of that tribulation time at a big battle called the Battle of Armageddon, which is actually a campaign takes a long period of time for all the things to come together. We'll be studying that on Wednesday night. But he comes back and ends that thing in the Holy Land, and then he sets himself up as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Sadly, for lost people, it'll be too late. Matthew 25, Jesus gives a judgment. We call it the judgment of the nations. When he comes back to this earth, there's just two types of people living here. Sheep and goats. All the sheep are going to get to enter into the kingdom. Saved people. You say, where do they come from the tribulation time? Well, that's a whole other study, but when you read Revelation chapter number 7, there's a great multitude of people who will be saved in the tribulation time. Though many of them will die and give their lives for their faith. But that will happen. Nonetheless, the sheep get to enter the kingdom, but the goats, the people who are lost, those who absolutely were against the Lord, they are going to be cast into the lake of fire, which Jesus said, interestingly, in Matthew 25, 41, was prepared for the devil and his angels. It wasn't prepared for men because God didn't want anybody to go there. He's provided the way out of there. But if men will not take it, they're going to wind up there. And the judgment of the nations takes place. So you see, God has a plan. He's still in control. Thankfully, if people will wake up, see the light, come to Christ, not get caught up in the sin and ways of this world, you're going to be with the Lord when all these terrible things happen on the earth. Isn't that good news? Praise the Lord for that. 
So the day, are you praising the Lord? I want you to turn to Isaiah 11 as we wind down this morning. Once the Lord is ruling, as it says here in Revelation 11, 17, conditions on this earth change dramatically. Hallelujah for that. And Isaiah 11 pictures it. In verse number two, or verse number one, it mentions the stem of Jesse. That would be Jesus, a branch growing up to the earth. Verse two, the spirit of the Lord's upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. God's Holy Spirit will be here in the power of the Lord Jesus to rule and reign over this earth. What a change when that takes place. Notice verse 3, shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears, but with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. In other words, can you get righteous judgment today? One of the reasons they did away with capital punishment is because they say, oh, there'll be too many innocent people put to death. Now, of course, back in the Old Testament, I reckon God knew that when he established it. But you see, men don't want to follow God's ways. And so they throw that off and they say, oh, you know, we can't. All they're saying is we can't judge righteously in this world today. And we can't. Men do make mistakes. You see people that have been in prison for years find out they were not guilty. They, they were not guilty. And they let them out. But years they had to spend in prison. Men cannot judge righteously but one of the things that changes is in that kingdom where Jesus Christ rules and reigns there will be righteous judgment totally because God doesn't just see on the outside 1 Samuel 16 7 God sees on the heart you'll have righteous judgment what a wonderful time that will be notice in verse 4 2 it mentions he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked so people will not get away with wickedness. And righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. There will be faithful judgment meted out during the millennial kingdom age. Verse 6, the wolf also shall dwell with the lamb and the leopard shall lie down with the kid. Can you imagine that happening today? Can you imagine that a wolf would get along with a lamb? <laughs> Make him lamb chops. You wouldn't get along today with a lamb, but in this millennial age, there's no more killing like that. And it says the calf and the young lion and the fatling together and a little child shall lead them. Can you imagine a little child leading a lion? Don't think so today. The cow and the bear shall feed. Their young ones shall be lay down together and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. So they won't be flesh eating anymore. Lions will start eating grass and things like cows and all do. The sucking child shall play on the hole of an asp, a deadly snake back in the Middle East at the time the Bible was written. They can play with it and the weaned child shall play on the hand of a cockatrice den. These deadly snakes will not hurt anybody anymore. I can see my wife playing with a deadly snake. Wouldn't be near a snake today, but anyway. And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse which shall stand for an ensign of the people. On it shall the Gentiles seek and his rest shall be glorious. Whenever Isaiah says all this, then in chapter number 12, he has to praise the Lord. And in that day thou shalt say, O Lord, I will praise thee. Though thou wast angry with me, thine anger is turned away and thou comfortest me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He's also become my salvation. So bursting out in praise when you see what the Lord's going to do in the future. God has a plan. And folk, as you read about it and see it in Scripture, when things are darkest in this hour for you, and they're dark, I know, in the world, not happy with the way the world is at all. But, you know, as you see that, just remember God has a plan that's being carried out. It's going to change in the future. So now, spend time praising Him and thanking Him and exalting Him for what's coming, for His plan being carried out in this world here below. Well, 
I hope today you see the need of praising the Lord. There's a lot to praise him for. And you know, someone has said years ago, it's amazing what praising can do. It will change you, change your life, change your attitude, change everything if you get involved in praising and thanking the Lord day by day in spite of your problems and difficulties that you have. Dr. Shelton Smith wrote this poem I thought I would close with today. God who is the God, the God of eternity's past, the God of creation, the God of the universe, he is the God. God who is the God, omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, he is the God. God who is the God, great in mercy, generous in grace, giving in abundance, he is the everlasting God. God who is the God, our means of salvation, our source of righteousness, our hope of heaven, he is the God. God who is the God, unique in his being, unmatched in his character, unequaled in his stature, he is the God. God who is the God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, he is the God. God who is the God incarnate at Bethlehem, sacrificed upon Calvary, received up into glory, he is the God. God who is the God, our Redeemer, our Advocate, our coming King, he is the God. Praise him today. Praise him today. Let's bow our heads together. I don't know your heart and life here today. I preach primarily to Christians, but if you're here today, do you know for sure you're on your way to heaven? I didn't ask if you're a good person. Didn't ask if you've been through a baptistry. Didn't ask if you belong to a church. None of those things will save your soul. There's only a person who can save your soul. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. Have you come to a time in your life when you realize you're a sinner and you're lost? You need to repent of those sins and you need Jesus Christ as Savior. If not, now is accepted time, the Bible says. Now ought to be the day of your salvation. If you're here this morning and you do know the Lord as your Savior, how's your life of praise to Him? Been praising Him for His person? Praising him for his permanence. Praising him for his plan. Just some things from that one verse to praise the Lord for. Oh, how we ought to more and more, each and every day, spend time in praising and thanking our God. Heavenly Father, speak to our hearts today about just how great you are and how we need to acknowledge that. And as the psalmist said in Psalm 145 too, every day will I praise thee. And I pray this message will just encourage us all to be more involved in praising you. And we see the things today in Revelation 11:17 we can praise you for. Speak to our hearts about that. Lord, if there's someone here without Christ, how we certainly pray you'd speak to their heart right now. And show them that this ought to be the hour they come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen. Let's stand to our feet. If you need a psalm book, turn to page.